This is my bed. And looking right out this window here is this giant bird of paradise with these big old flowers on here. And it's been pretty nice because you know, I wake up in the morning usually to hummingbirds and I get this great breeze through here and I sleep with a comforter most of the year just because it's such a cool breeze. That's facing west. Behind me is my bathroom and I keep the window open there. Right now I'm getting hit with a breeze. It's nice and cool in here. The problem is I haven't slept for the last couple of weeks because I get squirrels, sometimes rats, in that tree right there. It's it's pretty stinking crazy. <laughs> a couple of years ago I did a video because I was out, popped the screen off and I had my tomahawk and I'm whacking at rats. So I got to deal with that. And the way to really deal with it now is since the flowers have bloomed and most of them are dying off, is just to cut them off. So, yeah. That's what I'm going to have to do. All right. There we go. I was just talking for 30 minutes. Somebody came up the stairs, and uh, that threw me all off. And I double-checked the phone because I was going to start it over, and I realized I wasn't even recording. <laughs> so you saw the way I started the video. I just I cut the flowers down. Last night is the first night's sleep I've had in weeks because in the middle of the night, animals were coming up and uh, waking me up in the middle of the night and I was you know you're in that state you're half asleep I just wasn't getting enough rest crazy so today's video is not what I wanted to talk about but I put this t-shirt on my New York Dolls t-shirt and then it just a bunch of these memories start flooding in things that I thought well this could I could talk about this because I could talk about rock and roll and music a little bit <clears throat> probably talk a little bit about some people I've known uh, in the music industry. I've been asked to do so before in the comments of some of the videos. So, yeah, I guess we'll just do that. Because if you guys don't know who the New York Dolls are, uh, it's pretty good stuff. It's some of my favorite music. But if you've never seen them before, it might rattle your cage a little bit. Because <laughs> they're friggin' trannies, man. <laughs> yeah. They're dressed like women. Uh not that it matters. I mean, it's like transvestites, by the way. Men that dress like women are not gay. They just like dressing like women. Uh, it's not, you know, it's, that's just how they dressed as women. They still got more ass than a Starbucks toilet seat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Didn't hurt them from scoring. And the, this glam rock thing, which was the term, although, you know, New York Dolls were punk rock, but still, you have to think, like, when was this happening? It's always been there. I mean, Little Richard, man. Makeup, the whole deal, you know, kind of effeminate, you know. And uh, you had David Bowie, right, Ziggy Stardust. You had Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Of course, you had the New York Dolls. You had Alice Cooper. And it just kept going right into the 80s, right? The hair bands, uh, Poison and all that. All, you guys know, right? Long hair, makeup, the whole thing. So whatever. Not my thing. I've never worn makeup. Yeah. No, I've never worn any makeup. Uh, <laughs> had a girl girlfriend of mine one time. Uh, we were having a good time. We were pretty lit. And she was like, you got to put one of my dresses on. I was like, she, and she took a picture too. So that'll probably show up someday, you know. <laughs> but it didn't really fit me. I was, I'm too muscular. I, I went <clears throat> like this and the whole thing ripped down the side. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> never walked around in public with it. I am way too honest to, for you guys. <laughs> so I was thinking about the New York Dolls. And I was thinking about that whole scene, because I was born in 66, and this is was starting at that time, really, late 60s into the 70s, so I was a little young for that, but I had this friend, I already pulled this out, like I said, but my buddy, uh, Shake and Steve, uh, Shake and Steve, man, he was the DJ at Yakety Yak for a long time, and I was DJing at this bar called JJ Rockers, uh, down the street. I've told these stories before. I used to, I started off working a door, worked the floor, became a bartender, eventually became a uh, DJ there. I used to open the cl club up, close it down, all of it. I did every job there was, and I wanted to work every night, so I could, because I could do all those jobs, I, they could always fit me in. But uh, that's how Steve and I met. There was this other place, I think it was Sir Kyle's. This is all Seaside Heights, New Jersey in the 80s. And Steve would be in there every night having some Jack Daniels and Rolling Rocks before going to work at the Yakety Yak. So I would go in there and hang out with him. We bonded. 
And uh, Steve grew up in North Jersey. He's got like six, seven years on me. He's like he's in his early 60s, like 63 or something. So when I was too young for this, he was right at the right age to be exposed to it, especially being in North Jersey. And he and his friends were all musicians. He played bass, <clears throat> still does. He's got some really cool basses. If I can, I'll insert a picture of him right now. So hopefully I just found, I think there's a picture on my phone maybe with, with Steve with his bass. It's a picture just from a few years ago in front of his 57 Chevy. I think that picture is him with his, because uh, I haven't looked at it yet. I'm assuming it's on my phone. I, that should be a picture of him with his uh, Thunderbird guitar. Uh, really nice friggin' bass, man. Never broken. Uh, and, you know, anyhow, this guy's cool. He's got a Kramer Flying V aluminum uh, bass and uh, he plays his washburn a lot but anyhow so he grew up with the guys who if you ever heard of drama rama so he was their original bass player when they were kids are you watching this steve like anything wrong as a matter of fact this is a picture of steve when he had hair <laughs> that's a joke that's just a joke for steve this is him with his hair down because he normally had a pompadour all the time so i love this guy man he's one of my favorite people in the world but steve really instilled a, uh, an appreciation in me for i already knew who the new york dolls were and i'd listened to their music but i didn't really own it or not a lot of it at the time <clears throat> and as a youngster when i saw men wearing makeup and shit that rattled my cage a little bit i couldn't allow myself to listen to it because of the visuals it's just how it was you know i wasn't being judgmental i just didn't know how to i didn't know how to deal with that as a child you know which is why I don't really support it being uh, such an open thing for kids today. Trannies reading books to kids in public libraries, like little kids, you know. <laughs> what the hell is that? It's silly. Just leave it alone, man. Let them figure it out when they get older, you know. But uh, through Steve, I got to hang out with his pals, Drama Rama. This is a picture I took in uh, at the Melody Bar up in uh, North Jersey. That's uh, John Easdale, lead singer of Drama Rama. It's a little faded. It's been hanging in my kitchen for like 30 years. That was a crazy time. Maybe we'll get into that. But um, it was it was uh, those days in the 80s, working at JJ's as a DJ <clears throat> was a lot of fun. And I got to work with all these bands and it made me think of this other thing. And I just looked it up on, on, on uh, YouTube here and it's this guy Smitty. Now, Smitty was on MTV a lot, and he used to, they used to film him at the Yakety Yak Cafe at a time before Shake and Steve became their DJ. There was this guy, Ron, Ron Na Na. So apparently Ron's got a bunch of videos up on YouTube from this time period. I just finished watching them, or a few of them. I'm going to watch some more after I'm done with this video. And it was really, it's just, it's kind of mind-blowing. I'm seeing people in the videos that I know, and this, that's a long friggin' time ago, man. 87, 88, 89, that, that time period. Uh, 87, 97, 2007, 2017. So, yeah, I mean, you know, do the math. It's a lot long freaking time ago. But I've got something here that I wanted to show you guys because of the whole Smitty thing. Because Smitty and I became pals. Uh, I didn't even realize. I knew that he was at Yak and Yak, but I didn't know everything he was doing over there. And the, it was the same family. Let's just say the, the clubs at the Jersey Shore were family-owned. The family. <laughs> so what happens is they <clears throat> share talent around. And so Smitty started coming into my bar, JJ's, and hosting on nights when we had bands. And the first night we ever worked together, it was right when I first, it might have been the first time I ever DJed. I don't think so. I think I had a little bit of confidence behind me at the time already. But it was new to me still. And I wasn't used to people uh, coming up to me and the way that they would request uh, songs. By the way, I got to tell you, man, DJing at a rock and roll club. JJ Rocker Seaside's only rock and roll nightclub. Yeah, used to do that all night long. It was so much fun talking on the mic and you got that power. You call people out on the dance floor and having people going and, and just picking those right songs to just get them going and knowing how to slow the tempo down to, so they can go buy some drinks. <laughs> Remind them to tip their bartenders. That was all a good time. 
And but when people would come up to the booth, uh, I dealt with them a specific way. I just I wasn't going to take any crap. You guys know the trauma I had in the Marines. When people are yelling and they want something from me, I shut it down. I take control of the situation and I adjust their attitude instantly. And I'm in the booth with Smitty and I didn't know him yet, really. We're just He's like, we're just setting it up. We're talking about what his routine is going to be, how I'm going to play his music, the intros, all the whole thing. We're setting this all up. I had to work the lights and everything. And uh, he saw how I was dealing with the the people asking for requests. And he gets on the mic and he says... Listen, when you come up to the DJ booth here with this DJ, this DJ reman- demands respect. This is Mr. Mike. And that was that became my DJ name, Mr. Mike. And that's what they put up on the marquee whenever I was DJing. Boom. And it's, it's weird how you get fans. It's like this thing. This YouTube thing is bizarre to me. Uh, we're going to get into that too, maybe. I was, I was talking, I was texting with uh, Sarah this past week. So a little, little news there, maybe, I suppose. But... That was, it was a little easier for me to deal with that because that's what I was doing for a job and they knew who I was and you you see him out on on the town and say, hey, DJ Mr. Mike, that was a fun time, it was a good time. But he got a kick out of the fact just of how I dealt with people. It kind of shocked him. He's like, you can't do that with people. But then he saw how I did it and would turn it, have fun. I would play their music. You get some pretty big tips just to play a song. Like some of the best money I made uh, as a DJ was just selling CDs sometimes because some guy would come up and it's like his girlfriend's favorite song because I'd find some at the time you have to remember too. Well, a lot of you weren't even around then, but CDs were a new thing and not all the music was yet available on CD. So my music friends and I, we would find these music stores up in North Jersey. We would make these pilgrimages up there because they would get the new, well, they weren't new music. It was old music finally being released on CD. So you had to hunt that stuff at the time. Uh, Of course, we all did the Columbia House scams. We all did that. They're still looking for me, I'm sure. (laughs) we, We all built our music collections with that, you know, 14 CDs for a penny or something, whatever the hell that was. (laughs) <laughs> I had to get, I, I, I got a lot of music that way. But um, if you had a CD and it was like some guy's girlfriend's or wife's favorite song and he didn't have it yet, he'd come up to the booth. I had so, I sold CDs at that time for $100 sometimes just because he wanted that one song on that CD to make his wife happy or his girlfriend happy or whatever. It was awesome. Turns out that first time Smitty and I worked together, we both discovered it. We're both Marine veterans. Smitty, of all people, had been a sergeant in the Marine Corps. And when I left town, when I was leaving town for L.A., he, he did this for me. I hope this gets on screen here. <clears throat> so that's Smitty. I hope this is on. This is all on the screen. I can't see what you guys are looking at. But, uh, yeah, you got the Curly Shuffle he did, the King Tut song, the whole thing. That guy was a, a laugh riot, really cool, funny guy. Nine years ago, he died. I had no idea. I just discovered this uh, watching uh, YouTube tonight. So anyhow, uh, this this thing here is an interesting story uh, with John. I guess I could talk about it now. It's been a long time, but... Uh, Steve and I used to hang out a lot and do fun stuff, go looking for music, thrift stores, buying hip clothes and whatnot to be DJs, you know, looking cool. He had it down, though, more so than I did. He, he, his DJ booth at the Yakety Yak was open. It was all glass block, and it was right there, and everybody could see him. The DJ booth at, at JJ Rockers was behind a chain link opening and a wall, so you could see me, and I could see you. You'd have to come up behind that booth, up some stairs, and... If I was talking to you, nobody else could see what was going on there. <clears throat> a little more privacy, and it didn't matter what I looked like, really, you know. Although, you know, I looked pretty good. <laughs> there's, there's some. It was, it, it's. There's a picture of me DJing one night. I don't know if I could find that to insert it, so I'm not gonna go looking for it. I know it's not on my phone, but we're all better looking when we're young, right? I was a cute kid when I was young, and it was a good picture of me smiling. I was with this uh, DJ, Keith. I think it was Keith Jared was his name. I don't know. I don't know if Keith was his, the right first name, but I know his last name was Jared. W J R Z. I think it was. He was a DJ there, and 
I used to have this long curly hair. Oh, I got a picture right here. Don't go anywhere. It's actually here. It's probably dusty as hell. So forgive me. I got nothing to grab here. Totally un, un, unprofessional as usual. Not ready. But this is a picture of me. This is a girl I was not going out with. She, we were both uh, bartenders. And we were working the same bar at the time. But that's me. I'm tilting it a little bit in case there's glare on the glass. Just want to make sure you can see it in focus there. But that's me with the crazy hair. <laughs> when JJ's closed, I went over to XS, Club XS. And Club XS and Yak Yak were in the same building. And they shared this breezeway to get to both. So that was great because me and Steve could hang out, smoke some grass during work and all that. Used to go up on the roof. It was a good time. But I cut my hair for that. And so there's a picture of me in this, uh, I think it was Keith Jarrett, WJRZ. He's wearing the WJRZ sweater. And they would do radio promotions at the club. And But I just just good picture of me with a smile. And that picture, when I got to L.A., uh, one of the first things I went up for, and I did this story a while ago, not long ago. It might have been a Sunday night chat video. <clears throat> The, that first commercial I got here was Opal Car commercial. You barely see me, but the way I got that job was that picture. I cut it, I stapled that little picture of myself to my information and sent it in, and they called me up. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Anyhow, I had the first time I met this guy was I had just I I was up. Uh, north, not far up north, but I was hitting some thrift stores, and I remember this specifically. I picked up some vintage 60s uh, sports jackets, like a shark skin sport jacket, and more like a beetle type jacket, and I came home, I was pretty excited, and I was thinking about my buddy Steve. I was like, I'm going to call Shaken, tell him what I got here. He'll, he'll dig on this stuff. And I get home, and sitting on the stoop to this house I was renting is John Easdale and Shaken Steve, <laughs> waiting for me. So, Apparently, he wanted to meet me because Steve told him I used to play his, his music at the club. And I did. Drama Rama was bad. That song, Anything, Anything, Last Cigarette. Uh, at the time, it was uh, Drama Rama Vinyl was the record. I'm not going to get up again and dig them out, but I've got all my Drama Rama CDs are all autographed by uh, John. Matter of fact, he autographed them that day. We went in the house. We were talking, and he saw the music. He was going through it. He pulled his own CDs out and just start writing in him. So he wrote these funny things on the CDs. Kind of cool. He was promoting vinyl at the time. And the story I remember, and it could be wrong, was that the record company wasn't promoting it. So he was taking it upon himself. So he was doing acoustic sets. So he came home and basically Steve and I became his roadies for a couple days, driving him around to all these little places to play. And we ended up at the Melody Bar that night. And I won't get into too much more about it because it doesn't matter. Typical rock and roll stuff, you know, backstage stuff. But uh, that was a good time, man. That was fun. <clears throat> I forgot to look at the watch again before I started. The wrist check. It's a Seiko. Uh, but they, some people call it a Daytona. It's the same movement as the Flightmaster. But I think this one's better because you can actually read this one. The Flightmaster, you look at it, it gives you a friggin' headache. You can't read the time on a thing. Anyhow, that's what I was doing. Late 80s, like 88, 89 or so till 92. And then that's when I came out here. Something like that. And uh, yeah, just kind of funny. I, I, I ended up meeting other people out here just because of other things I was doing. Like some of you guys know I was pals with that Ricky Rocket guy, the drummer from Poison. And funny story about that is... It, and I, I don't want to get too into it because I've told the story already, but that was all motorcycle related. And he, uh, I had the new Triumph Bonneville and I was on a forum just trying to learn how to make it go faster. <laughs> and you know, forums are there, everybody's talking and I had an accident and I actually have the jacket here. So I could show it to you, I suppose, but I've talked about the accident before guy pulled out in front of me. It was wet out. I went down, I slid on my belly, and the gun scarred up the front of the jacket. And I told the story on this forum, and I was getting a bunch of flack from these guys over in Britain, like, you know, Americans with their guns and all this other stupid stuff. 
And then I got a note or a phone call. I think I got a phone call. I don't know how he got my number, but I mean, I was, you know, listed and all that, but he contacted me some way. And he said, we're starting this group. It's more of an online motorcycle group, the Brit Iron Rebels. You're the kind of guy we'd like to have in our club. And, you know, I'm not a club guy. I'm not a joiner. I've had a bad taste in my mouth ever since the way things went down for me in the Marine Corps. I'm not joining anything. But this was just starting. So it wasn't like I would have to, uh, you know, be jumped into some club or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, I'm not going to put on a dress or put on makeup or do some stupid thing to be part of a club. I'm not playing that frigging game, man. I'm not doing it. <clears throat> so funny thing. Let me jump ahead here. Well, let me see if I can remember it. Uh, so anyhow, it wasn't really a thing at the time. It was just me and Ricky, this guy, Barney, this old guy. A guy, Dunsey, down in, uh, Dunsey, you ever watch these videos? I hope he's here watching sometime. He's down in Australia. And then anyway, we had some guy in uh, North Carolina. That was it, five guys. I was member number five. And that club, that thing took off, man. There's hundreds of members of that club now. So, but the first time I met Ricky, hmm, I said to him, I, I kind of goofed on him a little bit, like, you know, I, we used to make fun of you, dude, with the hair and the makeup and everything. And he just looked at me and he looked down at me because he's taller than me. <laughs> like most people are. I'm only 5'9". <laughs> he looks at me and says, yeah, well, that hair and makeup made me millions of dollars, you know, multiple times over. And I, I looked and I said, well, you got me there. <laughs> Where can I get a wig and some makeup, you know? <laughs> but funny thing about Ricky was <clears throat> we did this ride. I got pictures of all this, by the way. I, I've, I've always been a shutter bug. I used to carry a camera with me everywhere I went. And at that time, anyhow. And so our first ride, uh, we went out. And we're up, you know, in the canyons here. And I, I distinctly remember this. And there's pictures of these girls and everything. He sees me with girls. All these girls coming to me. Me charming them and talking to them. And that kind of was like... He, he picked up on that. This is a conversation we had afterwards because Ricky, like a lot of rock and roll guys, they learn how to play music. That thing you heard fall was a doorknob that is sitting on the floor over here. I don't know where the hell that doorknob came from, but I'm staring at it. Anyhow, sorry. <laughs> it's a freaking glass doorknob sitting on the floor. <clears throat> Must have been behind that picture I took down. So Ricky sees me getting along with all these women, and he was kind of impressed by that because rock and roll people they start learning how to play music and get into all that to meet girls i never did any of that i just was always myself and it, and it worked and then as we hung out more and started doing that together <laughs> it was fun that's when he started realizing that i was a different kind of guy and i remember him saying to me one day he's like i, I like hanging out with you and i feel safer around you because i know you would throw if you had to you know if something popped off so that was fine too, but our friendship eventually kind of failed just because of him being with that ego thing kind of thing. <clears throat> I don't hate him or anything like that. I just don't like being around too many famous people. It's it, it's hard for them, a lot of them, to keep the ego thing in check. When it's one-on-one, -on -one, you with them, that's one thing, uh, and that's fine. It's totally cool. I used to get along with him great, but when other people would come into the mix, like join us for lunch or something, they start treating him like he was Ricky Rocket, he would kind of turn in his pompous jackass in a way. And then what ruined it was me telling him, dude, when other people come around, you turn in his pompous jackass. <laughs> he didn't like hearing that, you know. So there's a lot of little stories with him, but it's 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 an old time in my life. I don't feel the need, you know. I guess for you guys, I could tell you some stuff, but some of it would come off as drama and that sort of thing, and it's just not what I want to focus on. But... uh I can, you know, there's other people, obviously, that I've been friends with and hung out with, but it's not jumping into my brain right now. But when I think of glam rock, that takes me also to a time back in the 2000s, <clears throat> around the same time at Ricky and everything. And I remember this girl at this bar saying this thing to me, like, because I looked more, sh at that time, I had my hair tight, kind of a pompadour thing, biker, rockabilly, more vibe, which is who I truly am. 
and uh, she was goofing on me that I wouldn't be cool with the glam rock scene, but she didn't know about my background having been a DJ and everything. But at that time, we get to this, we get to this thing here, because this is 2006 right here. These are just fun stories. There's no rhyme or reason to this video today, all right? This is the only trophy that I have, that I've ever earned in my life that I can think of off the top of my head. The 86 doesn't mean, this is a handmade trophy. You can see it says on here, it says uh, Slosh Kickball 2006 Mike Z right here. And so you see the guy, it's kickball with a beer. You see, you see the beer flying out of the cup here. <laughs> That's pretty good, huh? So I don't think there was ever another slush ball game. This, I think this was the only one. <clears throat> it was the only one I ever played in. It's funny, 2006, that's 18 years ago, man. I feel like I'm in better shape now than I was then. I was I was thicker at that time. I was coming off surgeries and everything else. I, it's a long, those are other motorcycle accidents, all kinds of stuff that happened. Matter of fact, yeah, 2004, I had a pretty bad motorcycle wreck. So I was, I was a little chubbier, I feel like, at the time. And I wasn't as athletic, really, because I'd been laying around trying to recover. But I remember this. Uh, so slush ball, in case you don't know, it's kickball. Did you play kickball in school? So the difference between the kickball that you played in school and this right here with adults is, at first base, there's a keg. And you got a big, one of the big, probably like a 32 ounce plastic cup. So if you get on base, or I could put this here where you could see it. I know I talk with my hands, so guaranteed I'm going to knock this friggin' thing over and probably break it. So with slush ball, you get if you get on base, you get this big cup, <clears throat> you fill it with beer, they fill it for, with beer, and you got it there. Now you've got to drink that beer for your run to score. So between first base and then moving the bases, and you can't spill it, by the time you get to third base, if you're going to score, that cup's got to be empty. And that's how it works. Keeping in mind, everybody's drinking in the dugouts and everything else. Now, who am I playing with? This was the time during the Derby Dolls. So the Derby Dolls were, uh, you guys know, roller derby, right? When I was a kid, roller derby was a joke. It was like fake wrestling. It was in black and white on the TV. And the girls wore these jumpsuit, skin tight kind of jumpsuits, you know, with pads, elbow pads, knee pads. It wasn't sexy looking at all. Look up the song Roller Derby Queen, uh, Jim Croce. Great friggin' song. It's pretty much that, it, it, it describes roller derby girls. And this friend of mine at the time, she's been on my mind lately too. I haven't talked to her in years. Wendy, uh, she said to me one day, she says, I'm going to start this roller derby thing. So she has this girlfriend. They did it. They started, they made it happen. The Los Angeles Derby Dolls was all her. Bank track, real thing. <clears throat> they pulled it off. A lot of people donated time to it, built the track and everything, and she kept trying to get me to go down there. I, I wanted no part of it because the, just didn't, first of all, I work all the time for a living, and I don't really have the energy for it, even back then. And I've always been more of a homebody, but you know, after the nightclub business and bartending and all the crazy, that, that's a crazy life. I had a crazy life for a long time, crazy life. If I go out, to this day, if I go out, crazy stuff happens. I meet crazy, interesting people, and crazy shit happens. Even now, as an old man, it still happens. It's, it's ridiculous. So that's why I stay in, to try to keep my life, you know, a little bit drama-free as much as possible. <laughs> I hate drama. But at this time, I was uh, not part of it. But before, I mean, I was by that time. This is two years earlier, probably around 2004 or so. But I just remember her bugging me about it. You got to come down and see a practice and, and all this. What I didn't know was she, she had this ulterior motive, which was fine. The way it played out was this. They were going to do us like a scrimmage, I guess. They were going to do, before they ever did their first meet, they already had their teams and everything. They were going to do this first time thing, right? Get some media there and all that. Matter of fact, I met Anthony Bourdain there. I had no idea who Anthony Bourdain was. I hadn't watched his show yet by this time. He was already pretty well known, but I wasn't watching it. And I'll never forget it. I went down there <clears throat> to see the practice before their first event. 
I met Anthony Bourdain. He was doing his L.A. thing. Uh, Derby Dolls making an appearance on one of his episodes. That was it. And they walked me over and introduced me to him. And he's a big, tall guy. And I went, hey, how you doing? What do you do? He goes, oh, I got a TV show. I was like, oh, oh cool, man. Good luck with that. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> no idea who I was talking to. I got a bunch of stories like that where I've met well-known, like, famous people. I have no idea who they are. <laughs> well, yeah. Good job, man. Good, good luck with that. This guy's already famous and rich and all this other stuff. This always cracks me up after the fact when I find that out. So I went to that practice or scrimmage or whatever the hell it was, and that's when she hit me up with her plan, which was, I asked her at that point, I said, you know what, this is cool. And also, that version of roller derby compared to what I had in my mind, totally different world, man. I mean, the L.A. Derby Dolls in 2004, 5, 6, this time period, most of these girls, they were all cool for the most part. And most of them were fucking hot, man. I mean, they're wearing mini skirts, fishnets, thongs. It wasn't your, it wasn't your mama's uh, roller derby. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> it was pretty wild. It was a wild scene. So I saw that and I was like, okay, what do you need? <laughs> I don't mind being a part of this. And what she needed was somebody to run the security. And that's what I did in the Marines. I was a security forces Marine. You can't get a better freaking guy to run your security than somebody who's like trained to do that. You know, top tier security expert. So that's what I did. And so for their first season, I ran their security. And it was at in this building near downtown, the brewery area. And up on the roof there was the Cretans. Like, they had a clubhouse up there, and so we had all these parties. I gotta tell you, the, those years, with the Cretan clubhouse upstairs, and the Derby Dolls downstairs, <sighs> some of the best times ever. Some of the best times ever. It was, that was, and I've got pictures of all of it. I'll tell you, I think about it sometimes. So I, I eventually became the official Derby Doll photographer. Like, they even bought me like a camera or something, or memory sticks or whatever. So all the parties... Uh, the events, I would show up and take pictures of everything. And I've got all that on old hard drives. <clears throat> Those would be, uh, that would be a book. You, I can make a, I could easily make a picture book of that time. And I got, always got great portraits of people. If you're my friend on Facebook, and I know I don't accept friends requests if I don't know you. If, if I haven't met you in, in 3D, you're unlikely, it's unlikely that I'm going to accept you as a friend on Facebook. It's not because I got something against you. It's just because I've been keeping Facebook small. That's been my thing since I got on Facebook in 2010. Um, I used to have a lot more friends on there, but I deleted them all because of all the nonsense that has been going on, like politically and everything else. I'm still friends with those people in the real world. I just didn't want to see their nonsense anymore. So I kind of culled it down over the last five years or so. Uh, having said that, Tell me in the comments. Uh, maybe I'm going to change my mind on that. Because I realize with the YouTube and everything, it might not be such a bad idea to open up the Facebook to more people. It's just, it's it's hard enough as it is with the comments on keeping up with it on YouTube. I don't want it. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do it. I got to keep Facebook tight to just the people I deal with. My family and friends that I've known, I grew up with, and I've had real dealings with in life. People I really know. I'm going to keep it to that. Every once in a while, a few people pop in because I, 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 I get to know you uh, in different ways. Maybe you buy something from me and we talk and I realize you're cool, that sort of thing. Like that's happened before. So my point there is a lot of the pictures are in the photo albums on the Facebook page. So if you do know me and you're watching this and you're curious, go there and look at the picture folders. There's some really good images in there of people. So that was a, a really good time. Now, because I was doing the security and I got to know all those people, there was always parties and that's what we did. And it was a real family with those people. I didn't, I was a good, I was 10 years older on average than most of them at that time. Uh, I was in my thirties already <clears throat> and uh, mid to late thirties. I don't know, man, I'm not going to sit here and do the math right now. I'm 57 now. So do the math. All right. So uh, I felt a little older at the time, and I had had a lot more life experience than most of those people doing crazy. I've been living alone since I was 14, you know, worked in the nightclubs, did all this crazy stuff, movie business, built houses at the Jersey Shore, the mob stuff. There's a lot of crazy stuff, man. <laughs> so to me, it was like, 
a lot of it was a little juvenile and there was a little a lot of drama it's all women man a lot of drama but uh the cool thing was there was fun stuff there too and you know it was camping trips with some of them all kinds of stuff and one of the things was this slush ball game so i'm going to tell you what i did to win this trophy <laughs> it was such a crazy day i had to give you all that background so here we are we're playing slush ball <coughs> Somewhere over there. I don't remember even where it was. It was in L.A. But uh, I'm like, I, I was never a big jock. I mean, I played sports in high school and everything. I was more interested in partying and girls. So my, and I was living alone. So it wasn't like I needed to be out of the house away from my family or anything like that. You know, I, if I was home, there was people over. I was having a good time. It was a good time to be alive. <clears throat> but... So, even though I wasn't like a hardcore jock, I did play sports. I was in the Marines. So, like, with me, it's team spirit. You're up there. You're egging everybody on. Let's go. Let's go. And that's what I was doing. Team spirit. That's motivating my team. Let's win and everything else. But the other team, you know, a lot of these guys, like, this is the thing about this scene here, right, with the Derby Dolls and all that at that time. Because a whole bunch of them were lesbians and they were, you know, the, a lot of soy. Sorry, guys. It's the truth, right? A lot of soy boy type stuff going on there a lot of beta males <clears throat> not a lot of big athletes you know a lot of the guys were you know pale with no muscle on them you know like they a lot of those women were you know strong women but the, the types of women that a lot of them are the type the only kind of men that are going to put up with their bullshit are those kind of soy boy beta males right so that's what i was that's what i was surrounded with for the most part i'm offending you sorry that's just how i saw it so I'm like this glowing orb of testosterone out there. Like, yeah, let's go, you know. And th these guys are making fun of me. They're fucking with me. You know, they're like, oh, you have figures, you know, friggin' Marine, there's all this other stuff. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not letting it bother me, but it's obvious. I don't fit in their little world there, you know. So there's a little animosity brewing with the other team. And it gets to the point where, you know, the, we're... Getting towards the end of the game, I suppose. I don't remember when this happened, but I'm on third base. My beer is down. You guys remember, you get a full glass of beer, big friggin' thing of beer at first base. By the time you get to third, if your run can't score unless you have an empty cup. I'm on third base. The ball gets kicked. I start running into home plate. Instead of this guy hitting me with the ball, or throwing it to the catcher to, to try to tag me out. He starts running at me, and he gets in front of me, and the, the catcher comes behind him. Now, there's two guys in my path. Just They're going to block my path. He could have thrown the ball at me, but they're going to run. This is all happening fast because I'm running full speed to home plate. They both get there to block me from home plate, so... I just go full on football, man. I get lower than them with my shoulder and I run into them as hard as I can. Boom. It's like a bowling ball hitting two pins, man. These guys fly. I hit them so hard that I even flew off my own feet. Bam. Like that. Bam. And I went up and I flew up like this. And I landed on my side and my back and I looked and they had dropped the ball and I got up and they're both, they're out, they're hurt. They're actually hurting on the ground. I hit them so friggin' hard. And I and I got up and I looked at them and I went up and I tapped home plate, score. Then I stood over them and I'm like, that's 200 pounds of Marine motherfuckers. <laughs> it's like, whoop, there goes the trophy. And I'm just like, yeah, like an animal, like a gorilla. <laughs> yeah, 200 pounds. Like, that. what are you doing? What are you thinking? You know, <laughs> all that. And they're on the ground like, oh, oh they're hurting. You know, I mean, I, I might have broke some ribs or something there. It was freaking hysterical. And the whole, the, it was right in front of the bleachers and everybody's like, holy shit, Mike Z, holy crap. It was just the craziest thing. So at the end of the game, I got the trophy. I earned that freaking trophy right there, man. <laughs> so that's the story. The only trophy I ever, I ever earned. I don't know how long I've been talking. I'll tell you one other thing I just thought of as I said that, because this group of people, I wasn't the oldest guy in the whole group, even with the Cretans and everything. There was one guy that was older than me. He was the president of the Cretans. But 
for the most part, I, he and I were the two oldest guys. There was one other guy, Nick. We were, at that time, they always used to say, we were the only two honorary Cretans. We'd do whatever the fuck we want. I'd go behind the bar and make a drink, whatever. It was fine. Um, but most of the guys were at least 10 years younger. And uh, some of them look up to you. You know, they see you do things. They hear about stuff. But, yeah, we did stuff together. We did motorcycle trips, and they saw stuff. And one of the things that happened, <clears throat> this is towards the end, Because in 2010, I had a pretty bad motorcycle wreck right here on Gower. I told the story, or I'm pretty sure I told the story, where I broke both my wrists and all that. I don't think it was a one that got away story. But I did talk about this woman in a video. I'm going to have to look this up, because I don't want to, you know, bore you if you've already heard it already. But, uh... And I don't want to go off on another friggin' tangent here, but in 2010, I had this bad motorcycle wreck, and I went down, and I broke both my wrists, and I've got a cadaver, that's what the scar is on my wrist here, I've got a cadaver bone and a plate in this wrist, so I just had the surgery, and I was recovering from the surgery, probably a week after the surgery, and I had no business getting on a motorcycle. Now, keep in mind, my Triumph was a Thruxton, it was a cafe racer, that thing was totaled, but I had another motorcycle. It was a 1995 uh, Triumph Tiger. Last year with the three Makunis on it. Uh, carburetors. And uh, that was a great bike, but it was a tall bike. Big, heavy bike. It was a dual-purpose bike. That thing was friggin' awesome. I, I should have never sold it. But um, it was a weird bike for me to ride. I like the cafe racers. I like being slower, lower to the ground, lower center of gravity. I always felt slightly un unsafe on the Tiger on the street. Great suspension, go over curbs and everything, but higher center of gravity was weird when you really had to maneuver around certain things in traffic. <clears throat> but in my, I got a tiptoe on that thing. I, I tried lowering the mono shock a bit, and I did, but I always felt too high on that thing. So. This night, it's like a week or so outside of surgery, cadaver bone, everything in my wrist, and uh, I decide to go to this party on my motorcycle. No business doing that. Should not have been doing that. <clears throat> and it was a big party on the roof above where the derby dolls were. And, you know, I, get, I hadn't seen anybody in a while, and they all knew I was hurt. And by the way, thanks to the Cretans and everybody else at that time, one of the nice things about um, having friends that you're riding with, and this happened to a lot of people, a lot of guys, some guys are dead now, right? Motorcycle accidents that we knew. It sucks. Uh, but whenever somebody got hurt, everybody came out of the woodwork to help you out. And, I mean, guys they gave me money. I was able to pay my bills. It was amazing. They're still my friends, a lot of them today. I still talk to quite a few of them, but I don't talk to all of them anymore. It's not like I don't want to. I just have my life. They have theirs. A lot of these guys got married, had kids. This is 20 years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Can you, I haven't said a word to anybody today. I sit down in front of this thing and it all comes up. So I go to this party, nowhere near 100%. And as soon as I get there, I feel like I got to catch up, right? So it's like, let me get a drink. Somebody hands me a beer. I do a shot. Somebody hands me a little thing. I'm like, you know, starting to get there, starting to get there. I've only been there about... 25 minutes, I've already had a couple shots and a beer and smoking some, you know, like, all right. And I notice a couple of my buddies, these Cretan guys, walking past me real serious-like. And, you know, spidey senses went off. I know something's going to happen. And I'm watching it. And there's some guy. Now, I don't know the whole backstory on it, but this is a guy, apparently he had been in that club. They had thrown him out a while ago. He was just a schmuck. I don't, I don't, I don't, never had any dealings with him. Don't remember what his name is. Don't know anything about him. All I know is <clears throat> they don't want him there. And they're trying to get him to leave. And he ain't leaving. And he's standing there in their face mocking him. And I'm looking at that like, well, that's, I'll just deal with this right now. So I take my jacket off and my camera and I hand it to one of the, one of my buddies without thinking. Don't, I don't announce I'm doing anything. This just, you know, went into instant friggin' you know, bouncer mode, marine mode. <clears throat> I walk up, 
as I'm walking, I'm hearing what's going on. They want him to leave. He's like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to, I paid for this beer. I'm going to drink this beer. And he goes to put the beer up to him. And I walk right up and I grab the beer as a can. I grab the beer in his hand, squish it, it splurts out, crush it, rip it out of his hand, all in one move, <laughs> throw it on the ground. I said, you're leaving right fucking now. He goes, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to give you the count to five. One, two, three, four. And I come in like I'm going to punch him right in the head. And before I could get to five, one of his buddies basically tackled him out of my way <laughs> before I can knock him the fuck out. <laughs> and I hear, like like I did the day, that's what reminded me of it, the day I earned this, I hear my buddy's girlfriend, Eric's girlfriend, Kubo, she goes, Mike Z's a badass. <laughs> it's just funny. My, my point is I had that reputation with these guys <laughs> at the time. It was fun, man. That was, so anyhow, he left. I mean, he, they understood how serious that was at that time. And the guys he was with, I guess he was talking tough because he had three or four friends with him to back him up. And as much as I love the Cretans, I don't know that any of those guys were that, that had that same attitude that I had. They weren't a three-patch motorcycle club. The joke always was they were a drinking club with a motorcycle problem. You know, <laughs> they weren't a three-patch club. So, anyhow, yeah, I guess that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I need to keep talking. Uh... Let's give it a moment. You know me. Every time I say that's it and I'm going to sign off, I could talk for another 20 friggin' minutes. I, you know, th this whole thing, it was going to be about a whole other thing. I'm going to not get into another subject right now. I'm just trying to think right off the top of my head. Is there anything else I could tell you about music people? Yeah, it's, it's not there. So let's keep this a short one. This is a short one for you. I hope you enjoyed it. This whole thing, again, New York Dolls, uh, my good pal, uh, Shaking Steve, you know what? There is some other stuff here. Just point of interest, you guys might get a kick out of it. I was going to show you guys. Oh, here's me. What do you think of that guy? This was a, she was a dirt. No, no, she's a photographer. The girl who shot this. I had her take a bunch of pictures of me and I gave her all my old camera equipment. This was one of the images. This was back when I was doing, I was still dabbling in the acting thing. Uh, so here's a shot of me some guy took. I hope you guys can see these. I hope they focus. This was a guy who wasted a bunch of my time. The guy photographed this. I did a really, he found me, sent me a note, and uh, he was a high-end photographer, taught himself how to do it. Tio Von Hale was his name, and he uh, is a musician. Got all his fingernails real long on one hand from Tyler, Texas. Fun guy. I got to know him. But then he just, he never followed through on the things he said he was going to do. He got me to do everything for him, helped him out, helped him out at his house. He was totally manipulating his girlfriend at the time and seeing other chicks and everything else. I don't mind saying that. It's a long time ago. And if he sees this, it's the truth, bro. Uh, and I liked her. She was a nice girl. But um, he took it upon himself to do all this crazy work as if this would be enough. It's not what we agreed to. He was going to build me a website and everything else. And none of that ever happened. But he did get some good images of me. This is a pretty good one here. And these images are solid, you know, 15 to 18 years old. Uh, yeah, anyhow, they just happen to be in the folder here. I don't know why. It's all motorcycle-related times. These are fun stuff for you guys. You guys are probably seeing this. All right, here you go. Here's my NXS photo. This is... Me here in Los Angeles around 1993, 92, I got here in September of 92, this would have been 1992. Laugh at it, laugh all you want, ha ha ha, yeah, it is friggin' ridiculous, what a poser. <laughs> That's pretty bad. I'm just looking to see if there's something in here that you guys might want to see. It's, my, it's one of those pictures that that chick took. This is this was at a moment when I was possibly going to get back into the acting thing, and I got my old resume on here and all that other stuff, but uh, did not do it. All right, that's enough. You know, we're going to say goodbye. It's all me, me, me. Before I go, somebody asked about the pictures behind me, so let me take the camera off this, show you these pictures real quick. A couple over here. Just tell you what they are. You guys might enjoy that. All right, let's see what we got here. These are the pictures that my dad had in his wallet. 
for years, and he gave them to me after my parents got divorced. That's me and my little sister and my mom. That's my mom. And that's my mom and me. Photo booth and Seaside, back when I was a little pee-pee head. These are two friends of mine. Uh, yeah, they're a couple. They were a couple for 20 years in 1992, and they're still together. Really good guys, Jeff and Jaw. Great stories with these guys. Really cool dudes. Uh, by the way, this painting here was done by Ron D. Moore. It's a guy I lived with when I first moved to L.A. It's a lot of crazy stories with him. I could probably talk for an hour on that. There's a drawing by uh, Jason Crum. He's in a permanent collection of uh, in, uh, modern art in New York City, Museum of Modern Art. And uh, I did a whole video on Jason. That's my old truck. These are not, that's just Burt Reynolds, you got movie stuff. There's Gene Harlow. The reason I showed you the pictures of me that, that guy took is he shot this picture. He went to visit my brother, that's my niece. This is a photo I took in New York City, Manhattan. That's the Upper West Side. That could be the same building from Ghostbusters. I'm not sure. But uh, that was the blizzard of 96. I was there. And then after that, I drove across the country. That's a really good story. If you guys want to hear it, uh, I'll tell you that. Uh, drive across country in 40, 56 hours. And all the adventures there. This is just a birthday present. This is a woman. I shot a lot of her. This is here in my kitchen. I used to do a lot of photography. I'm still a pretty decent photographer. I miss taking pictures. I love this image because it's almost like goofing on. I'm, there's glare in the photo, so I'm trying to move it so you can see the whole thing here. I guess I can't avoid it. But yeah, it's kind of like, you know, making fun of people that want to look at naked women in a way. She was beautiful. Got a lot of good stuff with her. This is Charles and Ray Eames. This is my, that's what you want right there. They had a great relationship. He was a designer, engineer, and she was an artist. And together they changed the world. Mid-century art, furniture, uh, sold by Herman Miller. Really good stuff. And I think that that's awesome. This picture is really interesting. <clears throat> Where I have my workshop, it's a client's garage. That's the house behind the couple in that car. That's the same house where the garage is where I work. Now that car was built in the garage where I have my workshop. They built hot rods in there. And one day there was a knock on the door. This old guy came by and he said, I used to live here and we used to build hot rods in that garage. And so he gave them this picture and uh, he blew it up, Tim. And uh, I got a copy of it. That car was built in my workshop, so I think that that's pretty cool. And that's it, man. I'm going to I'm gonna leave you guys with that for now. We'll keep this video kind of short for you. There's the library. That, that's all the stuff that feeds my head right there. <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks for being here. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. It's not at all what I wanted to talk about. Uh, stay tuned. This week coming up, maybe I'll insert a picture here at the end. I, I probably won't, but maybe I will. And it's um, the table I'm going to do. And I'll do a video talking about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it as I get the lumber and we get into it. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. That's it for now. Be good to one another. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. A lot of you have tomorrow off. I'm working tomorrow. <laughs> I'll catch you in the next one.